So what I usually do uh, in some of these presentations when I'm talking about the outlook is give my kind of agricultural outlook for the next year. And right now what I'm doing is doing that with 12 questions, okay? 12 questions about the future. But, and then I shorten it to nine for today. I threw out a couple because we don't have time. But what I want to do is just go through these questions without all the slides and all the charts. We'll hit them and I'll give you my opinions on them and then we'll get into some, some other things. So as I look at 2016, the biggest question facing us is, will ag profitability decline yet again? So 2015 was lower, 2014 was lower, is 2016 going to be lower? The answer, unfortunately, in my opinion, is yes, okay, almost certainly. Why? Uh, in 2015, we saw the first declines in livestock. Really, we started 2015 pretty strong on livestock, right? By the end of the year, where's livestock prices at? Down substantially. Feed, cattle feeders losing significant amounts of money right now on their closeouts. So with livestock falling now, with crops lower yet than they were last year, I mean, think about what happened with crop insurance guarantees the last few years. Every year has been lower. Last year, uh, what was the crop insurance price guarantee? Anybody know? It was like on corn? Four, it was like 415 or something, wasn't it? If we did it today, what would it be? 380 or something, I think, is where the board's at right now, 375. And that's, that's futures market. I mean, you, you have to take off basis, although your basis in this area is better than ours over in western Nebraska, where we're about 30 under. Okay, so it's just continued to ratchet down. Uh, can that change? Yeah, it could change. It could change pretty quickly. Uh, everybody thinks, you know, the people in Chicago, if you th talk to them, they're, they're pretty sure it's pretty easy to grow a record corn crop, right? It did the last two years. I mean, you just, you just buy the seeds and you, don't you have robots now that plant the stuff? And I mean, it's pretty easy, isn't it? Well, you all know that it's not quite that easy, right? And so while everybody is planning on us harvesting yet another record crop in 2016, We've got a long ways to go, okay? So I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, things could get better, okay? But right now, what the market is telling us is that it doesn't look great. So I think profitability is going to go down. Second, will costs alleviate, alleviate some of the margin pressure? Because what has happened? Why have, why have budgets and your clients' financial situations deteriorated so rapidly? Well, Output prices fell, and what happened to costs? At least the same. In fact, one of those years, they actually went up, right? And so that has been a big sticking point, is why haven't costs adjusted more? Well, 2016 is a year we're finally going to get some cost relief, okay? Uh, fertilizer prices are going to be lower this year than they were last year. I mean, they already are. Um, so we're starting to see it. The problem is, and we, we do some projects for major chemical people and fertilizer manufacturers, and the chemical guys, they were really excited. They said, oh, wow, fertilizer's coming down, so maybe the budget situation improved. And, and we said, well, unfortunately, crop prices fell even more, and so we're kind of right back to where we're at. My answer is uh, a little bit. We're going to get some cost relief. But the other side of it is, is what kind of costs can we get to adjust? We've got fertilizer, seed, chemical. Those are the big ones on the variable cost side. Fertilizer a little lower. Seed, what about seed prices? Anybody have a feel for where those are at? Uh, they're pretty flat, right? I mean, I, we bought our seed and paid pretty close to what we did the year before, unfortunately. What I think you'll see is people shift down the value chain on seed. So they'll start to buy less fancy seed, less of the really, really pricey stuff, but it's not because prices are coming down. The big relief that we have to get to fix the budget situation is on fixed costs. And what are the fixed costs? Well, Mark talked about one of them. What is it? Land, okay? Land prices, if commodity prices don't come back up, in order to get the budgets back in line, land prices have to come down. 
and rents have to work their way down. That has been stubborn, okay? And rents are always very stubborn to adjust, and it will take a while. But I think the pressure is clearly on on those things. The other one is equipment. Uh, you look at equipment spending, I think you will see it drying up, okay? Especially new iron. You're not going to see as much new iron be sold this year. It is really slowing down significantly. So farmers are working to get their costs uh, under control. It's just going to take a while. Will farmland prices continue to slowly soften? And Mark talked about that. And uh, I think, you know, I say slowly. If you go to the eastern Corn Belt, uh, prices are still pretty strong there. They're off a little bit. I mean, Iowa is down. 7 to 8%, although you'll talk to somebody, oh, no, it's higher, it's higher. What do we know? We know that the prices of commodities will not support farmland prices in Iowa over $10,000 an acre. It just doesn't work, okay? And people have to come to that realization, that reality on their own terms, but there is pressure on farmland. You're seeing it here. I think they're going to continue to slowly soften. You're not going to see a terrible fallout, and I'll talk about why in a second. Will the strong financial conditions in the sector hold? Now think about this. I used to tell people, it's from like 2007 to 2012, you take that period, that's probably the best five to six year period in the history of agriculture from an economic perspective. In the history. Of agriculture. That goes all the way back to World War II, okay, the boom in the 70s. I mean, it was phenomenal. We generated lots of profitability. And what that did is it significantly improved the financial condition of the farm sector. So we went into this downturn very well positioned. Uh, and that financial condition is hold. We haven't seen many problems on credit quality and other things yet. This being the third year, you're going to see more than you saw in the first year and more than you saw in the second year, okay? Now, the thing I tell people is, did, you know, did farms find a way to go bankrupt in 2012 when we had $8 corn? Yeah, they did. Some pretty high-profile ones, right? Big farms lost a lot of money, went bankrupt. Will we find people that have troubles in this environment? You better believe it, okay? So this environment is less favorable than the one a while ago, and we had problems then. Is it going to be enough to be terribly systematic and a terrible fallout? I don't think so. I, I really don't, and I'll show you why in a second. How many acres of corn and soybean are we going to plant? To me, this is the big question. The reality is the market is telling us we need less. These prices are the market's way of saying we don't need as much corn. We don't need as much soybeans. What's the problem? Well, what else are people going to do, right? You know, I go, you go to Iowa, and you're like, well, what, I mean, they're like, what else? It all stinks, right? And we're certainly not going to start growing wheat, okay? Because wheat isn't real good either, right? Wheat may be the worst of all of them in our area. So at some point, we have to see the areas like this slow down on dry land corn production and other things. And I think you'll start to see that, the Dakotas as well. But... Keep in mind, what got, the last time we had a major downturn, what reduced acreage of crops? It was a program, CRP, right? That, we took 30 million acres out of production with the Conservation Reserve Program. Now that's starting to unwind, okay? And so we're adding acres. Unless we do something like that, it's going to be hard to get that supply back out of the system. So unfortunately, I think we'll get plenty of both. The big question on production side then is the weather. And you all have been hearing about it. El, we, we're in El Nino, right? We've had a, I think you see some of the impacts of that. We've had a pretty mild winter here, a little bit more precipitation. I mean, I think about our farm, I can't believe I planted corn in June this year. And it wasn't because I was screwing around, okay? It, it was wet. And we don't usually have that problem at planting time here, right? Uh, and we have plenty of planter capacity, by the way, too. I mean, it just, it, it, was, it was wet. Harvest, same thing, right? It was a wet harvest, which we don't usually get. Now the question is, is it going to switch to La Nina? And I think that's, that's going to be open. I'm not a meteorologist. Uh, I can tell you La Nina is much, much 
less favorable for production than El Nino. El Nino, by the way, we did an analysis on the website, and you can look it up, but <laughs> you'll see that everybody wants to say, well, it's El Nino, it's going to be a record bin buster. In corn, that's not the case. In soybeans, you have about 75% chance of above trend yield with an El Nino conditions. Um, in corn, it's about 56%, which normally it's 54% above trend. Because generally, you know, trend is you're going to have a little bit higher chance of hitting above trend because if you go below, you usually go way below. So normally it's about 54% chance. With El Nino, it's about 56. It's not really a guarantee of a high corn production. Soybeans is much more likely to be above trend, at least in the United States. Uh, interest rates, and Mark touched on that. I'll talk about that. I mean, the big question, the Fed is, is doing what right now? They did something they hadn't done for a long time. They raised rates. I can't remember. I should have this number on the top of my head of when the last time they had raised rates, but it, it was well, I think it was like 2006 or something. It was the last time we saw rates go up, and then they were down, and then the financial crisis, they took them really low, and they stayed there until just recently. Now, all of a sudden, what's the word now? I mean, what were people thinking about the economy? Now people are starting to go, boy, maybe they, maybe they pulled the trigger too fast. Can the economy handle higher interest rates? Are they going to keep going up in the short term? I don't know. But I can tell you that the Fed's view, and, and we, I think I'll show you this, they, they look for maybe 2 to 3% over the next 3 to 5 years higher interest rates from where we're at. That's a long path, okay? And so when I look at it, I say the market is telling us rates are going up on the short term, but not dramatically. The bigger question for the land market is long-term rates. Okay, long-term rates, like the 10-year treasury bond, where is that going to be? Think about it today. There are treasury bonds today in the United States, 10-year treasury bond trades at something like 2.5%. Just think about what that means. It means that a whole bunch of people, the best thing they've got to do with their money is what? Send it to Washington in, in, in return for a promise. A promise of what? We're going to get your money back in 10 years, right? That's a good thing. Okay? And in the meantime, we're going to give you 2.5%. Does that sound like a great deal to anybody? Not really, right? Long-term rates are really low. Why are they low? Because there's not good investment opportunities pretty much everywhere you look. But outside the United, the United States is the only economy, major economy in the world that is raising short-term interest rates right now. So that tells you the rest of the world, things are not great. As long as that stays the case, I don't look for a lot of pressure on the long-term rate because you have to have better investment opportunities to get those rates up or people have to get really concerned about the risk of where you're lending. I mean, you can get a little bit higher rate, go to Greece, they may want to do that. I mean, they'll, they'll give you a little bit higher rate. Or you can go to Germany, and it's a lot safer. Their bonds pay, 10-year bonds are probably down around 1%, okay? Does that sound like a good deal? <laughs> Not really, okay? So I think this is, you know, I think in the long term, it's something we have to watch, but I'm not overly concerned about the dollar is getting stronger, and that is a major headwind for agriculture because we export a lot of stuff, and the stronger the dollar gets, the harder it is for us to export. And that's kind of the point of our article today about beef imports. It's kind of surprising. A lot of imports in beef recently, as demand has finally picked up for beef, and we're filling it with imports. Why? They're cheap. Okay. The dollar has appreciated enough to make them cheap. Uh, and then we've got this whole thing about China right now, which I think is probably the biggest wild card in all of it. What is going to happen over there? How bad are things? And to be honest, I'm not sure anybody knows. Okay? They went on a massive stimulus package. They built all kinds of stuff. Their economy is still slowing. Their stock market is seeing all kinds of gyrations indicative of people thinking growth in their economy is going to be slower. If they slow, they buy a lot of stuff from us on the ag side. To me, the question is, how bad does it get? If they can continue to grow at, say, 5%, that's still 5% on a very big economy. 
and that's still really good for agricultural demand. If it's a harder landing than that, and we have big problems over there, then, then I think we get nervous. But right now, I'm not as nervous. Although I will tell you, the world is a very uncertain place right now. I mean, think about what's happening in the Middle East. You know, the Iranians torched the Saudi embassy, right? And the Saudis broke off trade with the Iranians. They don't like them anyway. And what happened to the price of oil? It went down, right? That's kind of crazy when you think about it. And it's, a, it's a giving us a signal that the world economy might be a little softer than I think a lot of people are, are, are thinking because really that should be enough. You know, if that would have happened five or six years ago, oil prices would have been way up. Now they're really soft and in part, you know, we can't seem to get those sparks. Now, that being said, that uncertainty in that part of the world is a little scary, okay? Um, and, you know, just think about, you know, the U.S. boat that ended up in, you know, the Iranian... That could have ended poorly, couldn't have it? A couple bad decisions by individuals could have caused a really bad outcome. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of tension, and we definitely have to keep our eye on it, and that will caution some of my outlook, because it could get worse. 